Bernard Tobin here of the Innovative Farmers Association of Ontario uh, annual meeting here, talking now with uh, Michael Thompson. He is a, a farmer, uh, Kansas, Nebraska area, and we're going to talk about carbon in a regenerative farm system. Michael, thanks for stopping by. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Um, when you started this presentation today, you, you had this great quote, and I, wanted, I want you to comment on it. And you said, we need to treat the soil as more than a chemistry set. We need to think about biology and ecology. Yeah, um, I think there's no doubt about it. We've been very successful with putting on the, the nitrogen, the potassium, phosphorus, and knowing what kind of yields we can get. But we've never really thought about the, the role that biology plays, that the biology can, can make our nitrogen and potassium go further, you know, in our system. That, that uh, basically can, uh, if we get carbon in the system, we can, we can feed that biology and it can make for a healthier, more resilient plant, getting us through drier and wetter times. Yeah. I want you to talk more about some of the principles that you employ on your farm. And you've got five key principles. I want to dig into them a little bit. And it really starts with... with Keeping armor on the soil. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, I really like to look at keeping keeping residue over the top of the soil, whether it be a, a living green residue or a, or a dried residue after harvest. You know, you need to keep the residue on top of the soil, and that does two two things. It, it basically keeps a keeps a food source for your microbiology, and it also helps limit compaction when you're traveling across the traveling across the field. You also talked about minimizing disturbance and you know in increasing plant diversity. Mm -hmm. um, basically, any time that you can keep your 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 disturbance to a minimum, you're going to have more soil aggregation. You're not going to disturb that carbon out of the uh, carbon and till it and release it as CO2. And uh, basically, uh, in a corn bean rotation, there's not a lot of diversity. So if you use the cover crops, you can get a lot of different plant species in there you wouldn't normally get in a corn in a corn bean rotation. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about I guess let's let's go back to 2000 and, and about that time and you you were you really digging into this philosophy and you really went to no-till you thought it was going to be a big part of the solution but it, it, in your own words it didn't work yeah um, basically in 2000 we kind of adopted no-till because I thought it was going to make the soil better you know it was going to improve the soil and really we had a lot of issues still with our soil. We had hard pans. We didn't have enough uh, soil cover. So we struggled from about 2000 to 2009-ish or so before we ever really started with the cover crops. And that's when our uh, coupling the no-till with the cover crops seemed to start improving our soils after that. So what made the big difference? It, is, uh, to your point, you know, is it, is it sort of managing that soil, getting living roots into the soil, you know, feeding the soil? It just, the whole ecology of it sort of started to work? Yeah, I think that uh, a lot of it was just getting the living root in there, that you had a plant that was uh, photosynthesizing, putting exudates into the soil and building that, building that soil carbon. And once that soil carbon was there, there was more foodstuffs and food sources for that microbiology. And once that microbiology was there, it started giving off a, a lot of plant available nutrients for the plant that we didn't have to provide to the plant as extra fertilizer. You know, our fertilizer went further because we had all these soluble or all these nutrients from that biology in our system. And you also said hey you learned that you can change your soil. Yes um, I never would have known it except we dug a root, pit and root pits for a field day and we really have changed our soil when you actually look at the profile of the soil the the pure no-till was only 12 inches of, of carbon level and the the stuff where we'd ran no-till and grazed and 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 done the cover crops and no-till and grazing uh, there was 36 inches of dark carbon it's a more friable um, higher infiltration type of soil so it's really helped us in increase our uh, uh, the resiliency of our soil yeah. and resiliency also uh, from a moisture perspective you're in a 20 inch rain zone and you basically said you know with more carbon you're less worried about moisture yes uh, with more carbon I'm less worried about moisture I guess we can flip that around too in a wetter environment um, that extra carbon is going to be a water holder so that you can get in the fields during wetter times and and not make the damage to your soils that carbon is going to be th be there to uh, help with infiltration on those soils yeah um, you also talked a lot about microbiology and you know I think the statement that I really took away was you know you know microbiology uh, for farmers and farmers like yourself it's money in the bank you know uh, from a fertilizer perspective from an input perspective yeah um, it it really is there you know the biology is uh, just helping condition your soil um, putting more amino acids and a whole bunch of peptides lipids things that feed the plant um, you know we don't have to buy extra fertilizer some of these times because our fertilizer goes that much further so it's it's really the free 
help and it makes for a more resistant a resilient plant um, that'll get us through those times and and maybe even save us to have a healthier plant so we don't have to spray as much with fungicides and that kind of thing too yeah i mean it all sort of rolls up to you from a livestock perspective one of your last points is hey we want to get livestock into the the operation and, and i think as a young man of 18 you swore that you'd never have any livestock yeah. on the farm but this whole approach has allowed you to sort of integrate livestock and be successful with them and be that have them be part of the solution rather than part of the problem yes um, basically I started looking at how livestock could be more of a tool and um, I think there's a huge opportunity for a lot of people uh, in their operations instead of expanding acreage wise they can stack these enterprises maybe it'd be livestock or maybe you know even if it's not on on your own you know to bring the next generation back maybe it's a neighbor that wants to run livestock you know that you could partner with um, there's a lot of opportunities for, for working together you know that you can incorporate this livestock on the land and I really think the livestock um, helped to get that biology started that you know they they were kind of the catalyst that that helped improve our soils too it's kind of a whole system System. I can't really say one thing more than other, but you know, the no-till, the cover crops, the grazing, all of it played a part in you know starting our soils. And I really feel like we're just starting in infancy on our soils. That we still got a long ways to go. That we're, we're we've got a long road ahead, but but it's a it's a good road. So, hey, Michael, this has uh, been a great conversation. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it.